memories, um, and of course the actual physical items. Um, so the image that you're seeing on the screen right now is entitled Dad Holding His Dad's Eyes. Um, this one is called Mobius. Uh, obviously it's a Mobius strip. Uh, it's made out of uh, a photograph of my grandfather and my mother. Um, thinking a lot about time in these images, thinking a lot about how to represent different times in one single image. Um, I've been thinking a lot about these as uh, time collages, um, how you can represent um, sort of the time that the photograph was taken, the original photograph was taken, the time that the that my photograph was taken, but then additionally, the time that you're looking at the photograph all sort of at once um, in this confounded moment. And uh, this one, I always get a lot of questions about this. It's taken on a mirror. It's not, um, it's not levitating, though. I like the idea of it possibly being levitating. Um, this one is called Maternal Profiles. Uh, this one is, this was actually an idea that I um, really struggled to create. Um, I, I really struggled technically to make this image work. Um, and my mom who's in the room can vouch for that. I made her sit for this uh, several times, but what ended up working is when COVID happened and I haven't been in my mom's house since March, um, we started sort of experimenting with through the window. Um, pretty happy with how that came out. So I guess one sparkling moment from COVID. <laughs> Uh, this is called mom, mom's, mom's hands. Um, I get a lot of questions about what is photographic in this and what is not. Um, so I'll try to, can you see my pointer by the way? Yes. No? yes. Okay, great. Um, so these hands are my mother's hands, the hands hanging below hers. Those are blown up from a photograph of her, her grandmother. And this is her mother's hand. Um, the photograph that I photographed to print this image from was about two inches large. Um, so you can imagine that the hands were very, very tiny. Um, that just shows you how far technology has come. Um, and there are also rings both in the original photographs and on the photographs and of course on my mother's hands. Um, so doing a little bit of play there. And um, play is really important in this work to me. I think that when you're tackling a subject matter that can, um, you know, become somber pretty easily, that um, it becomes important to just have a little bit of levity, a little bit of play uh, included in the work. Um, this one is called Touching Noses with Dad. Um, and so as I continued to work on the project, it became clear to me that I didn't need to use the photographs in every photograph that I was making. Um, and that sometimes um, sort of a, a performative act or a sort of human sculpture um, intervention was more than enough to kind of say what, what I wanted. Um, this one is called, uh, eye masks of our grandmothers. Um, and we're both wearing uh, eye masks of our own grandmothers. So that's my mother. So she's wearing her grandmother and I'm wearing my grandmother. And um, both are the people that we resemble the most in the family. Um, this one is called Fuck You, Grandma's Teeth. Um, my, this is my dad's mother. Uh, this comes from her always saying that if you just smile wider, they can see fuck you written across your teeth. Um, so there's no reason to be sour. You can just smile wider at them. Um, and I kind of love that sentiment. Um, and we also have very similar teeth. <laughs> 
And I believe this is the last one that I'm going to show. And this is called Daddy's Lips. And it is, that is my father as a young child with my lipstick and nail polish protruding. Um, so I think I did it in six minutes. And uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Remarkable. Very good, six minutes and 21 seconds even. Um, I'm gonna drop my website and my Instagram into the chat so that everybody has that. Good, thank you, Amy. Thank you. Next up is Barbara Taroller. Okay. So um, I should say, first of all, that um, as I mentioned to Bryce before, the tr in the translation to, of this video into the Zoom uh, program, the transitions are not as smooth and the music is not as beautiful. So if you're interested in seeing this video, uh, you could go to my YouTube channel and see it. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and start. And I would say, um, you know, you can raise or lower your volume if the music's too loud or too soft. The test that I did seemed adequate, but you may have a different volume. So here we go. Oops, sorry. find myself as an environmental portrait photographer, preferring to work on location rather than within the constraints of the studio and all those pernicious electronic devices with their dangling connective cords. My subjects are often rendered abstractly in pre-negotiated settings. They are academics implanted onto their workspaces, musicians enwrapped in their instruments, artists in their paintings, children in exploration, people who float differently within their personal spaces outside of the performative of typical. The elderly or those with congenital challenges submerged in swimming pools, oceans, and streams. They are collaged into the poetry of their memories or refurbished as ancestral data within the family album. In production and exhibition, there is performance and requiem, poetry, music, reverie of some sort that accompanies these images. The process itself becomes a celebration with the portrait as the centerpiece, but always the portrait. As one does sometimes during periods of intense change and upheaval, I've begun reflecting on my earliest memories as a child waking up through a window of trees that my mother later taught me to draw as impressionistic renditions, and later roaming the forest, creeks, and mountains of Western Carolina, searching for treasured mica and hidden gems to keep for souvenirs from those excursions. During the first spring and summer of the COVID pandemic, I was led into deep exploration of the natural world of local trees. So it was with wonder to find myself traipsing around the woods and swamps, inspired by some of my more adventurous nature-loving students and comrades, exploring trees and the roots and foundations that feed and sustain them to frame the natural element rather than the human figure within it as the central theme of the imagination. But I've always been a portrait photographer and it is always the portrait and the notion of portrait that I seek. Embraced by this forest environment, I have reintegrated the figure into the frame, portraying the interconnective relationship of trees and those drawn to them. 
As I become more intimate with tree lovers, I have come to question ideas that bond us as humans to the inner lives of trees. I see trees as collaborative portraits, branches and limbs embracing, protecting, and sheltering those who lean against their trunks or beneath their branches, creating wind shadows and memories. It strikes me that preserving or crafting memories as garden lovers must do is exactly what my photography is about. Planting, replanting, gifting, and regifting of imagery, historical ancestral archives for sharing, creating, and preserving family memory. You and the tree in your backyard come from a common ancestor, a message from Richard Powers, The Overstory, spoken by Maidenhair from her perch in the canopy of the Mimas, hundreds of feet above ground and half a million days and nights old. There you go. All right. Thank you, Barbara. All right, Justin. Justin Cook is up next. Are you ready, Justin? I am. Very good. Take it away. Can y'all see this? Mm -hmm. Sweet. So um, the project I'm going to share is a documentary project about the effects of erosion and sea level rise. Um, the Outer Banks have been working on it for three years. Um, so essentially it's told through the story of the effects on a 150 year old cemetery on the edge of the Pamlico Sound that's slowly eroding away, which is being caused by um, overdevelopment of Hatteras Island and which interferes with the dynamic processes that um, allow the, the island to build and move and migrate westward and also uh, increasingly violent storms because of climate change and sea level rise. So um, the area is pretty remarkable because just by studying photographically, journalistically, this one area, um, you can get a feel for how the effects of climate change affect the people connected to the area, uh, the land itself, the ecosystem, and um, people's sense of mental health, including their sense of home. So ultimately the work is about a term called solastalgia, which is basically the psychological impact of climate change, which manifests as a sense of loss or homesickness um, that people feel when they're at home because the environment they live in is changing so rapidly. Um, I'm just gonna go through some of these photos. This is the uh, cemetery at, at the edge of the day use area in um, 1970. You can kind of see like there's a marsh and some uh, like a kind of thicket in front of it right on the shoreline. And uh, this is in 2017. Um, this is a portrait of the Pamlico Sound. Um, one of the big inspirations for doing this work is there's a book by Rachel Carson called The Sea Around Us, and she sort of describes the sea as the mother of all life, and it's kind of a place that we ultimately will all, re all return to one day. Um, so I'm trying to think about the ocean and the sea as a character in the work that essentially creates culture, shapes culture, and erases it. Um, the work is also, it's sort of, it's it's informed by like a 30 year research study by Dr. Stanley Riggs, he's a geologist at East, East Carolina University. Um, and essentially this stretch of coastline, um, he studied it um, and it's eroding at about like a foot per year, which is a result of the highway and the sand dunes on the Atlantic, on the Atlantic side of the island preventing overwash, which is essentially water, salt water and sand from washing over the island during hurricanes um, and building up the Soundside Beach which is sort of happening all throughout Hatteras Island, all along the Outer Banks. Um, 
that science is really difficult to understand. So I'm trying to illustrate it by telling a story about ancestral connection to home and what the vanishing of a little strip of land means to community. Um, I think it's important to tell quieter stories like this about the creep of climate change in the lives of ordinary people so we can see how it impacts their identity and culture. And in turn, those types of stories help translate science into an emotional language that people can understand. Um, this is Jean Hooper. She grew up in Hatteras Island and she still wants to be buried there at the cemetery by her grandparents, um, even if the cemetery is basically washed out to the sea eventually. Um, this is her in the 1940s. It's a photograph from what essentially is the follow-up to the uh, Farm Security Administration project, the Standard Oil documentary project. Um, they photographed her and her sisters and siblings down at the cemetery. And um, Hurricane Irene uh, did a lot of damage to our, uh, Jean's house. So she keeps these really special photographs in her family Bible. And that's how important the cemetery is to her. It's a place she used to play as a child too. And, um, this is her husband's grave. He passed away last year. His name was Burtis. So it's an active cemetery. They buried him down there. This is in 2017. This is Jeannie Creech and Don Taylor, two people from Hatteras Island who are essentially spearheading the campaign to preserve the cemetery. And um, Jeannie expressed very uh, matter of factly that the reason that she got involved with this project was because of soul nostalgia, her feelings of soul nostalgia, although she didn't have a word for that at the time. It also turns out that they realized through genealogy that, that we share a common ancestor, because uh, my grandfather's from the Outer Banks, and this woman, Dortha Midget, who was once buried in the cemetery, but her body was sucked away by storm surge during a hurricane. So she's no longer in the cemetery. So photographing lots of tourists down there and how they interact with the place. They built a bulkhead around it two years ago, which finally is preventing a lot of the erosion. Um, one other thing that's happening is investigating how uh, the erosion affects the ecosystem around it. So this is a live oak tree that was killed by saltwater intrusion um, that ultimately pushes the water table up and poisons the trees. Um, another thing that's really interesting is you can see the effects of erosion on the marsh. Um, a lot of people don't realize this, that marshes, um, a healthy marsh essentially will sequester the same amount of carbon that the Amazon can sequester. And when it, a marsh is destroyed and it rots and it's eroded and decomposes, it releases all that out back into the atmosphere. And you can see the way the marsh is eroding around the day use area. Uh, there's a lot of climate endangered birds down there as well. These are just images from the habitat. Um, this is the cemetery today actually from two weeks ago, from a drawing image. Anyways, that's all I got. Thanks. I'm gonna drop my uh, information into the chat as well. Thank you, Justin. Tama Hotbaum, you're up next. Are you ready? Tama? Tama? Tama, sorry. Hawkbound. It's okay. Um, I even wrote it down and I still blocked it. I, okay. I phonetically spelled it out on my paper here. I apologize. Well, I would like to thank Bryce and Stephen and the whole team at Click Photography Festival for organizing this event. I also would like to thank um, in absentia all the jurors for the Fence Project and particularly everyone here, all of you for being here. I am going to... I have always been interested in making art about the passage of time. It is evident in this somewhat recent work, this table composite, one of my pieces exhibited on the fence, this grid of a gathering at what was once someone's home. In gathering Philoli and the other work in my project, I insist by virtue of the construction process and the eventual display of the work, that the viewer take in the parts of the image one at a time. You are only able to view the entire piece in increments, moving one's eye from module to module, laterally, diagonally, up and down. I insist that the viewer participate in the experience of the work through the act of seeing and seeing over time. Um, 
I just wanted to uh, mention that uh, this is an, uh, a photograph of the display. Thank you to Anne Erringhaus who took this for me. Um, there was a mistake. Uh, my project was called Overtime Colon Imaging Home. Home was dropped from the um, image in any case. I have done something like this over the arc of my entire career as an artist. And you can see it with this piece that I consider to be my first work as an adult, made decades ago, a composite portrait landscape etching in aqua tint of my grandparents and my toddler father. I, I drew on an aluminum plate for this piece, looking at two photo portraits of my family, portraits that had been taken in Warsaw with a hint of New York where the family would soon flee. The piece also contains drawings of both the spring in the winter of the New England landscape outside my college dorm window where I sat and drew and imagined the seasons. The window sill and casing are drawn three times over the surface of this plate. The piece contains crosses time and its passing at the very beginning of my life as an artist. Time passing is depicted in the paintings I would make over the 20 year course of my life as a painter, a life before I would pick up a, a camera in earnest paintings built up from parts, separate modules existing on their own and yet holding together. The content, repeated columnar cypress trees, repeated columns, repeated triangular mountains, an Italian arcade moving into the distance, all insisting on a gaze which forces the eye to consider this part and then this part and all seen over time. Time was also of deep concern in the photo composites I made when we first arrived in North Carolina in 1996, first from pictures I would have developed commercially and brought back into the studio and reassembled in one layer, cutting out the excess with a straight edge and an exacto blade, tools of my trade for many years, time spent in bullpens and publishing companies, and then at home, freelance. The whole is made up of smaller parts Construction forces the eye to dart from spot to spot and finally weave the whole together. I would soon use images that I developed in the dark rooms of Chapel Hill and Carborough, first at the art center and then again at home. Pictures I would layer, not cut away. And finally, build up into the viewer's space, making space equal time. I played with solarization, making composite landscapes where time seems to fade and return to the present in parts. Time passing and the search for the center are subjects of the work I did over a number of years in shaped pieces. First with these crosswalk pieces, portraits on the vertical and the horizontal of trees in the woods near my home, Battle Park. One needs to peruse these works in time, stitching the frames together, move one's eye from side to side, from the canopy to the carpet, the floor of the woods. The same applies to the B squares and the lintel pieces I produced or had produced on aluminum with a return to the metal of my time as a printmaker. Again, one needs to visually sew together the separate parts of the images, moving from frame to frame, round from round or square and square. Time passing, lost or remembered is again my subject in the large black and white pieces I um, then produced with the return to a rectangular format. The sewing together is easier here. There is a more seamless image presented, but never completely so. There is always a jog, a slight misstep at the edges of the modules, a fog between individual parts. This theme continued in my move back to color and a large project that is made up of over 200 individual pieces. Forest bathing. These are the sections. And here, the whole. One most definitely has to read this work over time, both in the micro sense, the small frames built up in columns and rows, as well as the macro, where one must experience the piece in time. If this piece is realized at some point at its full size of 17 and a half feet, one will surely have to experience it over time as one walks from one end to the other. And now back to fence and the underlying theme of the work. As of 2011, I have used my iPhone exclusively for capture and these pieces are constructed in the camera roll of my, of my phone. 
Whereas the previous work was captured sequentially with a final image only imagined, anticipated, these pieces are manifested in my hand, captured sequentially and displayed as either for a cross, before a recent iPhone update, or now three across. The grids are manifested at various sizes, four by four for the um, by lowly gathering, and this, the parlor at the Horace Williams house in Chapel Hill. Three by four for view with a room and painting in the backyard. Painting in the backyard is something that I, I did a lot of and made a lot of pieces over the course of the spring and summer, the beginnings of the pandemic. It is what I did for many months. And back to fence and this, the fifth work in my project, three three by fours combined in this triptych of shadows on my garage with a hint of my cadmium orange red coat at the bottom and my feet. My feet are at the bottom of all of my grids. The repeated imagery of shadows on walls with slight variations in the triptych harkens back to the repeated imagery in the paintings and again insists that one read this piece from left to right. I submitted work in the category of home. The notion of home, of safe harbor, has had tremendous significance for us all over these last months. Home has been a refuge, a place of solace and safety, a place of work for myself and for many of us. It has been particularly significant for me over the course of my entire creative life. But for about four or five years, out of my decades of being an artist, my studio workspace has always been in my home. Home has been the place of creation, the place that nurtured my desire to depict, a place of comfort, energy, recovery, and healing. Home has been a place to return to the making of art. Thank you, Pamela. We've uh, reached the halfway point, so this is just a reminder if anyone has questions to please drop them into the uh, Q&A box with the icon that's on the bottom of your screen. And next up, we have uh, Don Raj Emanuel. Okay. Um, you ready? Yes. So okay. There you go. Nice clean. Yeah, can you see my screen? Yes. And you can hear me? Yes, again. Excellent. Just a moment. Okay, I'd like to thank uh, Photowill for including me in this, um, uh, in the Pence exhibit and um, the Click Festival for inviting me to talk today. I am a Greensboro based uh, photographer and I'm going to talk about my project, uh, Reclaiming, that's part of the uh, Fence exhibit. Uh, this is an image I made for a commercial assignment for a cheesecake brand. Uh, on the left, you can see I've laid out cocoa powder and uh, it has a cutout of a piece of cheesecake. And on the right, you have a piece of chocolate cake. I am a food photographer. Uh, but unknown to me at that time, this uh, image was the beginnings of uh, an art project. Um, it all started as I was cleaning up. I realized I liked the, when I was cleaning up the powder, I realized I liked the lines and the streaks that the cocoa made. It reminded me of uh, charcoal drawings. Normally I just walk away from it re without realizing or giving it a second thought, but um, I stopped this time and said, oh, let me take a picture. And that was um, a, a good thing to do. I started moving powder around to make photographs and started to see some interesting shapes take place, simply working with composition and space. And uh, I thought I should explore this further and I started calling these kind of pictures pigment drawings as I was making, moving pigment around and making photographs with them. Uh, this is uh, an early experiment with uh, turmeric. In this case, I would just put uh, turmeric down on a table on the surface, plexiglass here. Uh, move it around and keep moving things around until I found the design I liked. 
So for the most part with this series at this stage, I was working with the spatial qualities of the frame. I was just working with composition, division of the frame and color to some extent. And here are some other early experiments with the project. I realized at this time that um, this project wasn't progressing enough because I had too many options. I didn't have parameters set out to work with. And I realized then that I needed some kind of a visual framework to work within. And I've always been into this idea of form and content. Um, and I turned to this idea of form and content to kind of simplify the process to give me a sense of direction. Um, I teach photography at Randolph Community College and uh, I teach photography and design. And I just delivered a lecture on design. I walked out of that class and um, it struck me then to just work with one of the basic elements of design, the line. And so I picked line as visual framework for the series and uh, decided to use personal experience as content because I think every good piece of work needs a uh, form and content to go together. So content came from personal experiences, um, form came from basic design. And at this time, I also wanted to lay down powder with greater intentionality and with precision. And so I started using sieves to put down powder. In this video here, you can see I'm putting down um, turmeric. I started with turmeric because I like the color yellow and it's auspicious for us coming from India. Um, but part of this process had to be to learn about materiality, learn about how the material falls through the sieve, learn about different sieves, what kind of pressure to give it. All new for me as a photographer, as I think that ideas of materiality apply primarily or for the most part to um, painters and sculptors. But I guess a lot of people, will, photographers working with alternative processes will also think of materials in the same way. So, so this image titled Breach, made with sweet paprika is currently a part of the Pence exhibit titled uh, Reclaiming. Uh, this series is a photographic exploration using various powdered foods, such as confectioner's sugar, cayenne, black tea, matcha, flour. Uh, this image is titled Breach and it's made with sweet paprika, it simply showcases a line moving through space with a break in it and uh, Every photograph started with an idea and the idea for this was to illustrate this idea of like the, the bottom falling out. And I think this is a good representation, at least I, I thought that this is a good representation of that idea of the bottom falling out. This image is made with cocoa, white flour and the confectioner's sugar, titled the inadequate trio. So I'm drawn to artists like Elspeth Kelly, Mark Rothko, Helen Franklin Toller, Frank Scala, Yves Klein, color field painting, the work of um, uh, Joseph Albers, Johannes Itten for color theory. And all these works are a huge influence in, um, in, in my kind of artwork. I chose powders for various reasons, sometimes for color, sometimes for texture. Uh, in this instance, I would just type piece titled Envy using Himalayan salt and matcha green tea. I wanted to allude to this idea of like envy and so I used picked matcha, the color green, which we've come to kind of identify now or associate with poison, something unsavory. Most of the villains in movies are like in green and so I use this color green. This image titled Dark Cloud 2 uses Earl Grey lavender tea, confectioner's sugar. So I'm drawn to abstraction as opposed to representation because I find that abstraction isn't as rigid as representational. Um, this isn't to say that I don't like representational work. I do like representational work. Most of my commercial work is representational. I do like it, but I like the open-endedness of abstraction. I like um, the fact, I like abstraction for its universality. I think it's very universal, but more than anything else for this project, uh, abstraction was kind of, I was drawn to abstraction because it elicits uh, a, um, an emotional response. But this image is titled The Void, it's made with rose petals and confectioner's sugar. Uh, I meant for this series to be melancholic, meditative, austere, rigid, yet approachable and poetic and universal. 
these are new works based on the idea of the line. Uh, I still have a, a limited framework that I'm working within. These images are, uh, I'm using a Kashmiri a red chili powder for these images. Again, working with the line, with small variations on the line and limiting myself to a specific color palette. So I like these limitations. They allow me to uh, give me a sense of direction. And um, it's also nice to push those limits. And so I call this series um, um, Exploring the Line, Exhausting the Line, sorry. So I recently had uh, an opportunity to work on a cookbook and this offered me the total, and it offered me total creative freedom to do what I wanted to. And um, I applied, uh, I took these aspects of um, my fine artwork and used it for the cookbook. So I made a series, this cookbook was based on um, the quarantine. And um, I thought that during quarantine, you know, board games are a big part of our quarantine. And so I used board games as a visual kind of a framework for this work again. Uh, and I created this, this image based on Chinese checkers. This image introduces the, um, the aperitifs and dessert section of the book. And um, these are various board games illustrated to, um, to introduce various sections of the book. So for me personally, this kind of, the place that I'm at with this work is really important because um, I've always thought about, thought of my commercial work and my fine art work as two separate things. And now with this cookbook, I feel like the work has come full circle where I'm using all the characteristics or all the methods and methodology of the fine art work for my commercial work. And that to me is interesting. So to me, this coming, coming full circle, blurring the lines between fine art and commercial is um, I find interesting using the same aesthetic approach. And these are some images from the book. Thank you. Thank you, Dan Raj. Thank you. Okay, next up is uh, Joe Lipka. I'm unmuted now. Okay, share a screen. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Oh dear. Uh, Bryce, we're seeing your screen. There we go. There we are. Okay, so thanks for going through another Zoom meeting. This is what everybody wants to do on a Saturday. <laughs> and your interest and support in CLIC is truly appreciated by not only the artists that were presenting today, but by the staff and the volunteers that helped put this together. Um, art needs an audience, and, and you're out there, so thank you so much. Um, this is a long route to get to this project, so we're going to get going real quick. Uh, my first exercise after moving to Cary in 1987 was to walk down Academy Street with my 5x7 view camera and 40 pounds of gear. I love the old homes on Carrie's oldest street, and I wanted to tell a story about those things because it was there was stability in that thing. So, oh dear, hang on. Why does it not? Oh, there we are. Okay, my first, wow, we had some delay there. Uh, first project was a walk down Academy Street. It was my introduction to Academy Street and one of the first projects I've completed. An icon transformed was a, spread out over three years was a documentation of the uh, Cary Elementary School into the Cary Arts Center. And a change of pace happened because I got tired of doing the documentary photographs inside. And so I went for another walk down Academy Street. Um, and then one of the houses, I did a, a whole series on Southern Gothic, which was the Ivy Ellington Gothic Cottage. And it took three years because it sits back in the trees and you can only photograph it at certain times of the year when light falls on it. And you know, that's what photography is about. So um, the last project, I, one of the last projects I did was the Victorian lady um, was a, a project on the Jones Cottage, uh, one of my favorite places on Academy Street. Um, in 2015, the town of Cary undertook a major renovation of Academy Street and tore it up for two years. Um, so at, when that finished, I went back to Academy Street where the 
digital camera and a tiny camera bag and to document the changes because they were significant. And I wanted to figure out how could I bring the old and new aspects of carry together and how could I show them the changes that I had seen in the past 30 years. And a lot of the time I went through multiple versions of statements, introductions, and basically what it all boiled down to is what you see on the fence. And it says people go away, buildings are demolished, memories are forgotten. After the memories are forgotten, all we have left are the photographs. And I wanted to figure out how to communicate this in one frame. And it was inspired by Mark uh, Klett's uh, photographs at his re-photographic project, which was to uh, you know, take um, historic photographs and modern photographs and layer them together to show how those things work. Uh, my photographs didn't work this day way because um, I couldn't make it work because I only had maybe five to 30 years difference in photographs. So what I decided to do was to do before and after photographs with a little bit of text. Um, and then I like this setup, but there was just too much white space. And so I it was fortunate a town of Cary intern showed me a 1920s era map of Academy Street. And it was the perfect background for, for this thing because you were basically looking at the map of where the photographs took place, but the map was from 1920. Um, and what that got me into was an entree into the town of Cary's uh, archives. And it was uh, a fabulous idea because it was like going into your grandparents' attic and pulling out the old photo book. You had no idea what was gonna be there. So what I found there in these things were a bunch of photographs that people had donated. There were newspapers, yearbooks, um, formal portraits and stuff, but they were there. And I say, oh, wow, this is what I needed. This was the generational difference I needed. So this particular project became more or less like an accidental project in, as an adjunct to the previous pro the, the project that I was really working on. But when you get an accidental project, you just go with it because, you know, you just you just have to. It's just there. Um, this project resulted from about 33 decades of work, a lot of preparation and a bit of serendipity. And it seems to many right now that a lot of it, you people have talked about was project photography. And, you know, it seems that that's the way we're going in, in photography right now. It's a beautiful thing. Um, and this is one of the longest projects I've been worked on since, since 1987. But a project doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to require an NEA grant, a second mortgage, or maxing out all your credit cards to do. They can take as long as you want and cost as much as you want because you're in control of that one. Waiting for the Bishop was a project that took me about 15, 20 minutes, and we were standing in line waiting to tour the Bishop's Palace. And so this project showed up in, 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 in 15 minutes. One of this, one image, or some of these images are in Lenswork 149, which is published very soon. The Road No Longer Taken is one of two projects that happened on one rainy morning. Uh, when you shoot landscape, it's a crapshoot. This was a loser. Um, I didn't want to photograph in the rain all day. So it, we took three or four hours to make that decision and figured out and came up with two projects out of this one. Uh, one image from the road no longer taken is gonna be in the lens work, uh, Our Magnificent Planet. Hang on, there we go, come on work, there we go. Um, Hills Half Acre, uh, I spent an afternoon photographing there one, one, one year, one day about 10 years ago, or long time ago, and then 10 years later I went back and photographed spent a whole week photographing in an incredibly strange place. Uh, it was a great, that was a great deal of fun. Um, passages and portals. Um, my daughter told me that I was the best door photographer in the world. Um, you know, I'm not going to bother with, I'm not going to argue with her. But it, her comment intrigued me and I went back and started looking at photographs of doors uh, and I stopped counting at 170. So, um, I gathered the best ones together and, and came together with a project that I didn't know I even had. Um, the next project, stealth project like this is chairs. Um, I had no idea I had so many chair photographs, so I'm gonna have to look at those. So 
um, the journal until March of this year, I, I decreed my rule was that I would my project would have uh, let at least 12 and as many as 40 images. And uh, in this March, I said, why do I, why did I have those pick those numbers? And they were very arbitrary numbers. So I said, look at that. And I said, well, let's take a look at others. And now I have found I have a lot of little projects that are four to 12 images that work well together. Um, and so that's what I've started to do with my, my publication, the journal. Um, I'll take four or five of these little projects and put them together in a magazine type format and put it on my website because projects can be as big or as small as you want. Okay, and so um, while I've got you, in, while you're on your computer, I want to let you know that I do have a lot of uh, uh, my primary method for communicating and sharing my photographs is through my website, which is in the middle. Um, and then there are links there to the daily photograph, which is my daily photographic blog. And then postcards from the creative journey shows up twice a week on Thursdays and Sundays. So if you just can't have enough Joe Lipka photographs from this, from this little presentation, website and two blogs should fix your Jones. Thank you much for staying away for this. And uh, I'm finished sharing. Great, thank you, Joe. And next up is Ann Arenhaus. Thank you. And do you want me to share to share first or to talk first? I'm going to talk, talk a little bit and, and then I'll let you know. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks to everybody who's out there watching and thanks to the fence and Click and Barbara who's helped me with my images. Um, I went to see the fence this week and I was so moved by it. And I felt how many different realities are going on all the time. We all know this, but photographers have made these different realities um, available for us to move from one to the next, to the next, to the next. So my images are from Ocracoke Island where I've lived for almost 50 years or a lot of 50 years. And we had a very big hurricane uh -oh. um, when I moved. Um, everybody talked about the 1944 hurricane and then came last year. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. So I don't know if you've ever been through a hurricane, but it's a very strange experience to look around your house and decide what am I taking with me because I might not be coming back or it might not be here when I do come back. So uh, anyway, let's go to the first image, Barbara, please. Thanks. So all of these I made with my cell phone and then I edited them um, to make them look sort of like old glass plate negatives. Uh, the island after the storm was really, really changed. Many things were gone. Many things were flattened. Uh, and it felt like a different place to me, a different time and a different place. Okay, next slide, please. So I wanted to treat that um, in a, a different way photographically. So editing to look like these old glass plates made it seem like maybe it was the 19th century and letting the highlights blow out and things be um, just, you know, not how I would usually shoot, <laughs> but I wasn't shooting anything that seemed familiar and I needed to photograph it, to photograph it in an unfamiliar way. Next, please. So one of the Islanders looked at this picture and she said, this seems so familiar to me. And it ended up being a piece of land where she had worked, she had lived, 
and then it turned into a dojo and she had studied capoeira there. So, so much of her life had happened on this singular piece of land, which now looks like this. And then I just, I became really um, affected by how history is carried by buildings so often. And someone else mentioned this too. When the buildings are gone, how do we, how do we remember what happened there? And how do we show it to somebody new? If we say, well, here's where we used to have something. Next, please. Um, a lot of Ochre Coke, or some of our biggest buildings were built in World War II. So at this site, there was um, a World War II barracks, which originally was down at the harbor. Then in this right around 1970, it was moved behind the school and became a recreation building. And then it moved out here onto Highway 12, which if you've been to Ocracoke, you know is the main road. So what had been a World War II barracks became a restaurant for about 30 years. And then it all came down in Hurricane Dorian. So this one building had carried uh, so many different moments of history and school children playing in this building. And um, I, I'm very affected by this. Next, please. I became very affected by the emptiness of what used to be so familiar. And in this picture, there was a duplex from World War II, which was always called the Green Apartments, even after they weren't green anymore. Everyone still called it the Green Apartments. Then it became part of a motel and it was totally flooded. In the storm, we had seven feet of water rise in two hours. So it was just a giant force, a giant force. And when it went away, the water, um, September for the rest of the month was so incredibly hot that everything quickly molded and mildewed and then began the destruction. At this point, we've now had 50 buildings, mostly historic, taken down. Next, please. This is one home on Lighthouse Road, and you just can see bits of what's left behind. Next. Uh, these are the, this is the fish camp. A lot of the guys keep their boats out here, and these are just little work sheds and also places where they gather and socialize and have a few beers and talk about fishing. Next. And former site of a very, very popular motel that was, I think, built in the 50s. But the windswept feeling that still seems to exist there on the land uh, was really affecting. And I just want to put in a word here about category one storms. What, what we had with Hurricane Dorian was a category one storm. And people think, oh, well, that's, that's not much. That's just a category one. It all depends on the tide, uh, the time of day, so many different factors. And this category one is the most damage we've ever, ever seen. So not to be misled by those categories. Next. Now we're undergoing this process of lifting a lot of the buildings. And this is not the final height for this building, but it has to go this high so they can get under it and restore uh, plumbing and power and systems, then they'll lower it a, a bit, maybe two feet from where it is now. 
So suddenly we have this uneven visual field around the island. What historic buildings we have left are still low to the ground. And then we have buildings way high in the air. So as a photographer living there for almost 50 years, this is very disorienting also how to uh, how to look at this. And I liked learning the new word about feeling uncomfortable at home because it seems unfamiliar uh, that someone else mentioned. And I really, really understand that because things there are visually familiar all the time to me. I drive around and go, oh, they moved their garbage cans to the other side of their lot. So, you know, I just really have noticed all the small things. And now it's really big things. Next, please. This is out at the public beach, which um, is National Park Service land. It doesn't belong to the village. And just truckload after truckload after truckload of garbage and debris and people's belongings uh, went out here and this mountain just grew higher and higher. And after the storm, um, 9,000 large truckloads of debris were removed from the island. It's hard to grasp how much that is, but for many months, a lot of that was sitting around the island and no one was allowed to come on the island except those of us who live there. Next, please. That might be the, that's the last one. Okay, you can click off that, please. So I think that's it. Thank you for listening. Great, thank you, Anne. And uh, last up uh, is Geisha Warfel. Geisha, you ready? I am. Let's see. Okay, so thank you. Um, Click Photo Festival and Photo Photoville for hosting the fence and this event. And also thank you for the jurors for selecting my work. And congrats to my fellow artists for being part of um, the fence. I will briefly talk a bit about my background and then I um, talk about the, the Slave Dwellings project. So I'm a visual artist who primarily works in photography. And in my work, I explore how the relationships humans have with the environment in urban places, but also in, in landscapes. So some of my work is focuses more on urban places, others more on, on landscape. A recent project is also on climate change. And in my work, I combine a range of influences from my background as an artist and an urban planner and visual sociologist but also having lived in Germany where I grew up um, in the UK and in the United States. My photographs engage with the socio-political implications of um, spatial processes by exploring notions of geography, history, race, class, and gender. And in most of my photographs, you don't see any people, but my work um, really talks about the traces people leave behind in the places that I photograph, either by using the spaces living there or by passing through. And I am normally drawn to unusual, derelict, mundane, and often overlooked spaces because I think that these spaces offer a vast area of, of hidden local histories. So the slave dwellings project is part of the oppressive architecture project, um, which explores the relationship between architecture and oppression in different historic moments and systems. So I started out um, photographing oppressive um, architectural structures of the National Socialist System. 
I'm, I've been also photographing, as you can see here now, um, structures in the American South um, related to American um, slavery. The project will also, once I can travel more, um, I will photograph Japanese American internment camps and um, I would also like to photograph um, the current um, uh, internment on the centers for where immigrants are interned at the border. So my project uh, in, examines the inhumane ways, inhuman ways um, that slaves were forced to live in labor on, on, on southern plantations as represented by the architecture. And um, these architectural forms aided southern plantations and their owners um, with commodity production, human reproduction, and social repression. And I also explore with this project how these architectural structures continue to influence the contemporary landscape, its, its inhabitants, and our understanding of history. And I'm raising the question whether architecture can be used to commemorate or, or reconcile a country's past. And coming from Germany, I am very interested in that topic because I see a huge difference in how Germany um, has been treating the, yeah, the structures from the Holocaust, for example, where the major concentration camps were all preserved and um, turned into memorials and museums where people learn about the history and um, they serve as a reminder for what happened with, I find that here in the US, um, the history, especially of, of slavery gets ignored. And um, I'm always astonished, for example, to hear or see that people can rent um, the big house for weddings, which would never happen in, in Germany. Um, in a, a concentration camp, for example. Um, so I think that's why I also think it's important to preserve these architectural structures. But um, because in most cases, it's only the big houses that get preserved or have been preserved. Not many slave dwellings um, exist anymore. And very often they sit on private property. So either difficult to find and I have to obtain permission from the, the property owners. So, um, so far I photographed 11 former plantations, some of which are historic preservation sites and they're much easier to access than others. And um, I've also been working with a, a principal who is based west of, in Madison, west of Greensboro, who has put me in touch with several property owners and um, also been looking at the website of the, the Slave Dwelling Project that Joseph McGill um, has started up and he's interested in sleeping in every existing slave cabin or slave dwelling that still exists in the US. So I, I normally when I photograph, um, I set up everything on my, my large format camera and I also take a, um, a backup photo with my digital camera just before the sun sets and I use strobes to illuminate the buildings. Um, I also mostly photograph between October and March and um, when fewer snakes are out and also when, when it gets dark earlier. And I normally work with an assistant or if the, the property owner can help me because there's no, normally a lot to carry around and um, I have shown this work previously at CAM as part of the oppressive architecture show. And the images are normally like this small, as you can see here, they're just 11 by 14 inches. And then that was, it was also included in the picture architecture show in Pipa in China two years ago. Um, yeah, and I think that's it keeping it short, but thank you, everybody. Thank you, Geisha, and thanks again to all the presenters. I believe that is the end of our list. A reminder that uh, if you have any 
questions, please drop them into the Q&A box that you can access through the icon on the lower part of your screen. And I'm going to turn it back over to Bryce, who has been <coughs> taking in the questions and is going to uh, read them out. Yeah, there's a few that are sort of broad. And I'm glad that uh, Jasmine Chang has joined us. She's with the fence up in, in, uh, in Brooklyn. So it's good to have her with us. And, uh, and she's asked a question, but I'm gonna try to make it break it down a little bit individually. Um, and, and so actually, since you just finished, Geisha, I'm gonna ask you, um, Jasmine's asked a lot of us how our processes changed during COVID. And I know you just said you typically photograph from October to March. Um, so now's about the time you'd be starting again. And I don't know what you do in the meantime, are you doing the research and, then, and, and now what will you be doing well, so I actually went to Winston-Salem and photographed Old Salem in at the end of May with one of my former students. So that was a bit of an adventure because we were both wearing plastic uh, nitride gloves and wearing masks. It was very humid and we were just sweating. Um, so it was felt like an adventure. Um, well, I mean, I only take photos for this project on occasions because it's it's difficult to find places. And right now I, I focus more on the project about climate change, um, about the effects, the impacts of climate change on forests. And so I went to the North Carolina mountains for a few days in July, which was also an experience to travel during the pandemic. Sometimes. Yeah being the only one wearing a mask and mm -hmm. so yeah uh, thanks uh i sort of have a question that uh, duly i want to send to justin and tama um justin i actually see that you responded that a lot of your changes uh pandemic are, are less shooting people in these spaces and you know doing portraits of the water and the spaces and that's been one of your reactions and tama i would almost my question to you is you know, the very first work I saw of yours with all the grids, they were uh, out in the woods, exteriors, trees. And I, I don't know, did you start doing these interior type spaces pre-COVID? Uh, and are you doing more of them now because you just don't go out like you used to? So I don't, I hate to, uh, Justin, do you want to start first? <laughs> Answer that first. Um, you're muted, Justin. Both of you are actually. Sorry, I'm like really bad at Zoom, so bear with me. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I mentioned in the chat, like my process has evolved, like basically out of boredom, because I just get like really bored with the way I do the work and then I try, try to find new ways to see and like interact with the stuff that I'm photographing. Um, it's so like a lot of the commercial work I'm doing these days, it actually pays the bills, requires like more lighting. So I'm trying to apply that to the documentary work that I'm doing. And then I like COVID, my COVID anxiety beginning of the year was just like pretty crippling. So I spent a lot of time just like photographing quieter scenes like in my own life. And then I was just now able to get back to the Outer Banks a couple weeks ago. Um, and just kind of approach stuff the same way and only interacted with people that I knew um, to be like not positive for the virus. <laughs> so, cause kind of like I, when I go down there, there was just not a lot of people wearing masks. So I think safety is the first thing that's important to me. So. Well, Tama, Tama, I know you're not at all paranoid about the virus, are you? <laughs> uh. um. <laughs> Uh, I, Bryce knows that I have uh, spent the last seven months mostly in uh, my home in my yard. Um, but uh, it's interesting, so the, the pieces that you saw were, were the um, tree portraits in the in Battle Park. Um, I think that's what you were talking about. Yeah. The, the um, project I did previous to that was Silver Screen, where for essentially two years, two or three years, I shot the TV broadcasting the movies that my mother loved. So I was able to be inside and watching television while I worked um, for some years. Um, and then in 2015 or 16, I um, started a 
practice of walking through the woods and um, the uh, uh, crosswalks uh, came out of that. And that, that lasted for a number of years. I think throughout um, and, and the black and white, uh, the, the rectangular format pieces um, also were mostly done, all of them were done at, in Battle Park. Um, throughout all of those years, however, um, I was always uh, struck by things in my house and um, made images, made pieces uh, from uh, beautiful spaces in, inside. So um, uh, I think maybe actually since COVID, I have been outdoors more than I ever have, um, including um, photographing every morning and many times during the day a wildflower patch that we planted in the backyard for the first time. Um, and as I said, I did, I, at the beginning of the pandemic, I just didn't do much photography. I didn't know what I felt about making photographs or art or showing. And I went back to my roots as a painter and I took my French easel and painted in my backyard. But then I would document the, um, the paint sessions, the painting sessions. Um, but I have been outdoors actually more good. Uh, than ever. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Amy, I'm gonna go all the way back to your first, first presenter, but you mentioned that this is a, you've not been working yet on your project as long as you, as you would typically work on a project. Are you still able to keep working on that or is that paused or where do things stand now for you in the creative process? Um, it's a little bit of both. Um, I think that I, I haven't really been able to work with my parents in the way that um, I previously was. Um, it's usually like very collaborative. We spend hours together inside um, their house or mine, um, like laying in beds together. Obviously not the type of behavior that's uh, appropriate right now. Um, I've, you know, I've been continuing to work on the project um, on my own, but I do think that there's sort of a portion of the project that I had to just put on pause and haven't really been able to um, pursue. Yeah. Um, I have a, a sort of a technical question for Don Raj. I, I, I can't believe in looking at your images and then I love the video of some of the process. Uh, I also happen to love, even though you were saying there's form and content, but you liked abstraction. But I, I loved how your your the titles you gave those really brought those abstractions into. I, I could relate it to a, a dark cloud or whatever it is. The way you you brought meaning to abstract right. forms, which was I thought was wonderful. But I'm dying to know, with everything being so precise, and yet you have these manipulations that mm -hmm. start out, you know sharp and then poof, you know, and like how much and what tools are you using to do this? And how many times do you have to go back to the beginning? And it's just, it's so meticulous. Yeah, that's a great question. So I have to keep doing it until it, in some way this has a mind of its own. Now I'm trying to figure things out. So I use various kind of seeds, different sizes and every, um, you know, powder has its own like qualities some clump together some flow more freely so you have to work all that out mm -hmm. and um so it's all trial and error i have to and i'm getting better at it now it's kind of these skills that you have to just figure out i suppose as you work with it and i'm getting better at laying these things down but the slightest mistake and i have to start all over which is pull all the powder out or spray the surface down clean it off wait for it to dry and start over so each picture will take me anywhere from four to eight hours. Whew. Yes, and, and sometimes I have to try it so about six times, seven times before I get it. So it depends on the complexity of the image, but that process is a big part of it for me. As a photographer, I'm usually just pushing that button and getting that picture. But now having to lay this out and the, the, the camera just become like a side thing to it, just a tool to document it. 
that to me is interesting. And then the impermanence of it, after that, it, it's all, it all goes away. So in some ways, this also is like the Buddhist mandalas, you know, that you see the, the, the make and, and that, those are some ideas that I'm playing with. And also uh, growing up in India, we have this uh, elaborate designs that people make in front of their house every day to welcome the day and start the day. I'm playing with those ideas too. So the project, I mean, the ideas go back really far, but I'm using very much like, um, uh, you know, in terms of design, I'm using very Western ideas of design. Yeah. Line, form, shape, color, texture, and those kind of things. Yeah. Wonderful. But um, in terms of the process, I'm just using whatever I, I can. Uh, sometimes I use, um, I, I use a few brushes sometimes to take things, to take powder off when it goes places that I don't want it to go. But I've had to find like the steel rulers now to create these stencils. So you're not just using a can of dust off. And no, no. <laughs> yeah. uh, I need to start wrapping this up. I actually have to prepare for our six o'clock historic panel. I wanted to mention to Joe Lipka, I'm really glad you mentioned Mark Klett. Uh, he's been high on my list to try to come here as a keynote. So cross your fingers. But before we end, I mean, do any of you have any particular questions for any of the other panelists before we wrap it up and sign off? Going once, going twice. Well, listen, you guys all, congratulations on being on the fence. Uh, I do hope you get to make it out. Today was a beautiful day. It looks great. Uh, Barbara, thank you for working out something where we can get some people together out there. Um, and you guys have my email address from that last um, email that Bryce sent out, has everybody's email on it. I'll send a message to all of you guys too and keep track of that and Bryce will let you know. And I have learned that you can rewatch a live feed on Facebook, but I'll tidy this up a little bit, put a good title on it and post it on, on, on YouTube and I'll send you a link to that. So that will probably be the preferred way for you to share this with Excellent. people. Excellent. Thank you so much, Bryce. Thank, Thank you, Bryce. Bryce. Thank you guys. Have a great evening. Congratulations again. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.